First of all, Zach, um, what does direct democracy as a phrase mean for you? Direct democracy is basically about shortening the distance between people in power to such an extent that people can initiate or block legislation through the use of referendums. And that can happen locally, regionally, nationally. And um, uh, in the recent Green Paper, Jack Straw was talking about Britain being a representative democracy, not yeah. a plebiscitary democracy. So yeah. he was making a clear distinction between yeah. the two. Yeah. Um, do you think that was fair? Are they mutually exclusive? Well, it's a fair observation, although we have, you know, in, throughout our history, we have occasionally used referendums. My view is that we should use a lot more, though. And I, right. think, I think for genuinely local issues, like a new supermarket, for example, it should be possible for local people to initiate a local referendum. And, and, and allow their wishes to be you know, reflected in decision making. Um, nationally, I, I've spent some time in Switzerland. I made a small, not very good film on direct democracy um, as it happens in Switzerland, and I find it incredibly impressive. And there have been endless studies recently, in fact, showing that the more direct access people have to decision making, the more involved they are in democracy, the greater their sense of well being. And even between different cantons in a place like Switzerland, which each have different variations of the law, Places with the most direct democracy are the places where people are most content, and it's quite unambiguous and statistically unavoidable. Right, and I understand you're behind a referendum here in Richmond. I organised yeah. absolutely. I organised a referendum in Barnes. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have a place in law, which is a problem. Um, mm -hmm. But what I think is important is that we have a higher turnout in Barnes. We polled eight thousand people, which is uh, the people within a mile and a half of the proposed supermarket. But a higher turnout than you would expect in a general election, higher than the national average and 85% of people voted against it. Right. And I think that's pretty overwhelming. Um, and, and the fact that despite that, despite overwhelming opposition, the planning system is such that the central government can impose these kinds of decisions on communities. I think it's wrong. Um, I'm just going to mention another petition to you, which uh, may be a fair parallel or may not. Um, that of Brian Souter, who was petitioning against the repeal of Section 28 in Scotland yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. Um, do you think it's fair that people who have the means to put these petitions in place should be able to do it? Well, I don't think it should rely on people with the means. I think, I mean, if you, again, you look at Switzerland or some states in the United States where you can initiate referendums to block or initiate mm -hmm. legislation, if it has a place in law, then you don't require and you don't depend on you know, wealthy individuals. I think it's wrong that that should be the case now. But as it happens, the petition we organised in advance doesn't have a place in law, so it really is nothing more than a, um, an elaborate uh, demonstration of wishes of the people in Mars, uh, which is a shame. It should be much more than that. And um, in Scotland, and also beginning now in Wales, I've got a petitions committee mm -hmm. um, to, to hear petitions with a, with a um, process to follow, which is lacking in Westminster. Would you support yeah. something similar in Westminster? I would support. I think that the, this is one of the key issues. We have a low turnout compared with other countries. France was in the 80s, percentage-wise. Um, I think that would be something that we um, would love to see more of in this country. I think if, if people don't vote, it's not because of apathy, which is often the reason it's given. You only have to look at recent, you know, a million people marched against the war, half a million people marched against the you know, ban on hunting. Millions and millions and millions of people are members of pressure groups like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't think people are, are, are apathetic. I just think that people feel that they're not sufficiently engaged in politics. We have a choice every 1,500 days or so between groups of people that don't often look that different. Mm -hmm. I think people need to be more involved. So any move towards shortening the gap between people right. and power is welcome. I would like to see us go all the way to the use of referendums. Obviously, mm -hmm. how that would happen needs to be discussed. In Switzerland, you need 118,000 signatures, I think, in order to initiate or to, to put a referendum on the, on the, uh, into the political process. In this country, Proportionately, we'll be looking at getting many more. I think the hurdles should be quite high, mm -hmm. but it should nevertheless be a possibility. And um, we're speaking about referendums and, and petitions. Um, in what other ways do you think public could be directly involved in decision making? Because I understand you're in the quality of life working group yeah. and you've had a lot of public consultation along yeah. with that. Yeah, I mean, we have taken in as many views as we possibly can. We've involved I mean, close to 300 different across the political spectrum. So our energy work, for example, has drawn on research from everyone from EDF, which is mm -hmm. one of the biggest nuclear providers, also has a big uh, stake in decentralized energy, and Greenpeace, and everyone in between. So we've taken as many views as possible. We haven't been dominated by those views. We've had to so lay out a vision and pursue it. Otherwise, you end up with the lowest common denominator. So the, the framework we presented in energy, waste, transport, rural affairs, and so on, is a reflection of the, of the um, 
I suppose, a consensus within the board, John Gunn and myself and some other people we've been relying on. But we've taken as much evidence as we can. And um, what are the costs, do you think, to involve the public in decision making? Well, I think most, most arguments against direct democracy, I think, are really arguments against democracy itself. You have a fear among elements of the left that you can't trust the mob, you've got a fear among elements of the um, Tory old guard um, that similarly you can't put, you know, you can't put trust the masses. Um, and and, and I, I think that wildly underestimates the sort of collective intelligence of the people. And I think after a prolonged and proper and thorough discussion, prejudices tend to be ironed out. And I think the gut response of, of, of a large number of people is usually pretty good. I mean, ultimately, you have to ask yourself the question. You can walk, you know, walk through the streets and look around you and ask yourself whether or not you trust the people you're surrounded with, and then go to Parliament and ask yourself the same question. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that many. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I just don't think that the politicians, parliamentarians, have a monopoly on, on common sense. On the contrary, it's quite often the other way around. Um, finally, um, localism is yeah. a catchphrase of. Well, the direct democracy group, and it's something you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, last week, the government um, announced they were going to abolish a whole pile of public sector targets. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Lib Dems have been onto this for a while. Is localism the next big thing in politics? I, I think absolutely. I mean, as a term, it's already the big thing at the moment. How that translates into policy, we'll see over the next few months and, and years, I suppose. I think it's a big, certainly a big theme of the work we've been doing. Um, we have taken the view that decisions are always best taken at the lowest possible level. And occasionally that is national, mm -hmm. occasionally it is the individual, but it's the biases in favour of subsidiarity, I suppose it's the term that's used.